in these end times perfection is not an option <laughs> it is something that is a necessity think about what Jesus said in Ephesians 5 about the church a church without blemish without spot without wrinkle so there's no room for imperfection which means that imperfection cannot be tolerated this sermon on perfection is not like oh if I like to I would like to have that no you actually got no choice but to actually go into perfection if you want to be part of the glorious church of course the other option is to die early because <laughs> you're not perfect you cannot be part of the glorious church but if you do want to be part of the glorious church you actually have no choice but to be perfect do you realize that? Uh, the, the other choice of course is death uh, but you know you, you die because you're imperfect because imperfection cannot be tolerated in the coming days in the times that are coming you think that right now the tests, the trials that you're going through is, is tough you haven't seen what is coming yet you haven't seen what is coming when the Antichrist begins to unite the world you haven't seen what Jesus prophesied that we study in, on Thursday night that when, when men will hate you because they hate Jesus so some people say whoa, better die la, die la, yeah, die <laughs> why not be positive and say Lord help me to be perfect and what we're teaching here is that perfection is not by works see we're not teaching perfection by works we're talking about perfection by growth and growing is easier than doing because once you grow the doing is automatic which is part of what we had covered this morning in this we this morning define what perfection is remember we are we ask all of you for your definitions and you give different different defi definitions your definitions are good but not good enough your definitions are good but not perfect to define perfection you must have perfect definition and remember what you define will limit you what you conceive is only as far as you can go like for example if to you being healthy means once in a while you get the flu once in a while you get high fever and sickness and then you're generally okay you got no major sickness let's say your definition of health right let's say your definition of health is once in a while like talking about let's say one year over one year and every year generally a year you're allowed to get some flus some coughing some uh, uh, light infirmities maybe a fever or two and simple things you can just cure no major sicknesses so you say that's your definition of help that will be what you receive but another person's definition of what is healthy is never get sick at all not even a cold or cough or flu then that's what the person will get then the third person's definition of you ask what is health or oh, health means you know you're, you're not just healthy and don't you, you see the other the second person is not bad correct the first person is not so good the second person not bad you don't get sick but here's my challenge why do you define help with a negative? Hey, you didn't realize that. 
Okay, remember, the first person's definition of healthy is uh, once a, a, a cold once in a while, a fever once in a while is normal. I haven't got any fever for years. <laughs> you know, once in a while, slide, slaughter, but no, no, not too bad. Once in a while, you know, uh, it, it, it come, but I know that's what I don't want. Not even a glimpse of it. Not even a shadow of a cough. Have anyone seen what a shadow of a cough looks like? Okay, a shadow of a cough is you feel like about to, and that's it. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> yeah. So, then the second person's definition is oh, don't get sick at all. But have you noticed something wrong here? They are defining what is helped by what is negative. That's a funny thing to define. If I ask you, what's a happy family? Oh, a happy family is a family that don't quarrel. <laughs> there are many families don't have a quarrel. All you have to do, do an operation, remove everybody's ability to speak. Because <laughs> they quarrel with their sign language. Okay, take away the hands. <laughs> I don't know, I'm sorry. It's extreme. But how can you define what is so good by what is so bad? Because we are all negative orientated. So, the third person defines what is healthy by saying, what is health? Health means, when I get up in the morning, I feel like I can run 5 kilometers. And throughout the day, I got so much energy that I could do 10 things, 20 things, and I don't get tired. And health is no fat. Looks good. Healthy face, healthy body, yes. well built. That is better definition than that guy. Correct? You can be, you know, this person defined uh, uh, healthy is uh, not getting sick. Yeah, but there are a lot of malnourished people who also, you know, bone showing, you know, instead of their abs, they show their bones, you know, and then a uh, uh, muscle so skinny that they cannot even live up. <laughs> A chair, you know, they, uh, all they define as long as you don't get sick, it's healthy. No, I think it looks malnourished. <laughs> so, your definition of what is health will define you because then you don't know what is normal to the world. Number one is normal. Do you realize that the world's definition is number one? Because they expect that every year when the flu season comes, you must get a flu jab or you, you will sure get it. And they say, ah, it's normal. That's, that's their normal. And then to the second person, that's good normal. But if I ask Jesus, our Lord, our Master, Jesus, what is help? He will reach point four. Help! is to have the life of God flowing to you and no sin nature and no decay in your body and your, you, you, you do not grow old at all. What a different definition! Can you see you're limited by your definition? It is just like God has this plethora of blessings. And God says, you can receive whatsoever you desire. Whatever you desire when you pray, believe that you receive and you will have them. And then we say, Lord, I just like an ice cream every day, good enough. It will be like going to a buffet, free, paid by somebody who loves you. And the buffet, let's say Singapore Prize Buffet, you know, uh, a super, super good one. $150 plus plus. You know, that's way above most people. For me, <laughs> that kind of buffet uh, will waste money on me. Because I, I actually all buffets waste money for me because I eat so little. So, uh, so you need to be, the, I mean, uh, this is just illustration. Uh, not, but, and if you, then you go there, you look at all the food, you go to one tiny little corner and just, you know, buffets might have tea and all that. 
and you have a cup of tea, one cube of sugar, and one biscuit, and you're sitting there. He said, hey, what? Why are you having that? Oh, this is my buffet. So, it's like everything is available out there. And because you cannot see it, you didn't. Then he said, hey, didn't you see all the other food? The person said, hey, God, uh, where? There. Bole. Because you cannot see, you cannot receive. Do you know it exists? That's what's happening. You have entered the grace of the Lord Jesus. You're called a child of God, a son of God. You are, and not only that, you know what the definition God says? You are air and join air. Right? Some of you are, are, are wrongly praying, hoping that your rich uncle will die and bless you with a million dollars. Right? So you're hoping you got some inheritance or a rich uncle. Right? So, whatever. Hey, your best uncle of uncles, eh? Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Please don't call him uncle. <laughs> he gave you his inheritance. Do you know that that is worth more than the planet Earth? That includes all everything on the planet. That includes the universe. And you didn't realize who he is. It is just like I can tell you, if you are given a blank check, there is only one time in the ministry, uh, someone blessed me with a signed blank check. Sign. And then, because I am a man of ethics, I call this person. And I said, they do, those days when I was in traveling ministry. And I said, do you make a mistake? You forgot to put the amount. You know, sometimes they leave the name for you to find. You forgot to put the amount. He says, no. And it was one of the charismatic Baptist people when I was traveling the ministry. And I wasn't want to stay in the house. So I wanted to give me a blank, blank check. Sign. And so I said, do you make a mistake? He says, no. Then he said, what's this? And this person said, the Lord told me <laughs> to sign it and give it to you and let you feel whatever you want. And now, I will feel anything I want. And of course, some people will abuse the system, lah, you know. Try to check, how much is this person worth? Lah? Or empty the bank account, right? One million, two million, or whatever. But I'm not like that. Uh, for me, money means nothing to me. I just want to be obedient to the Lord. Between choosing a million dollars and disobey the Lord and ten cents, I take the ten cents. So I pray, I say, What well, this person prayed, then give me a sign blank check. And actually, it's a medical family, quite well off, upper middle class. So, it would be worth a lot, a blank check. Worth. But what I feel in the blank check depends on my estimate of the person. If all of you are given blank checks now, and I don't tell you who is it from, and it's signed, put any amount you want, do you know that because you don't know who it is, you're afraid if you put too much, you bounce the check so it's useless? <laughs> Right? If the person got only 100,000 divide by us, say, ah, I think the person got only 100,000, that's why he do this game. You know? Then you come, 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 okay, I better don't put too much. Eh? Everyone put too much. One person, they bounce, you know, bounce check. But, but then if I put just enough, you know, I, I got something. Uh, let the other go and bounce. Eh? Put $1 million, 100,000, sure, bounce. Eh? So, your, what you put down will be determined by two things. Your needs, and the estimation of the person's ability to fulfill that check. But it also was a... There's something deeper. Because those two points only cover money, correct? It only cover money. But there was something as more valuable than money. You know what that is? The love and the trust a person has on me. That is worth millions of dollars. Correct? That love and the trust for me to take the blank check sign, I could go to the bank, put any amount, 10000 and grab it. 
That to me is more valuable than gold. I appreciate that person who did it. Up to this day, yes lah. Okay, the angel told me that that one uh, is a story in heaven. That that person, when they go to heaven, uh, will have a special reward for that one. So, thanks. But, because they, the angel is telling me, it is not about the check. That's early people counting. It is about a character of the person to show their trust. And that once heaven make a mark, the watcher right now, say, mark this for reward. And because to me, I'm touched more by the trust than the money or my needs. We have needs. We were traveling ministry. We have many needs. So, you know, we could be what needs. I was not looking at the needs, nor was I looking at the capacity of this person. But I prayed. I say, Lord, what shall I put on this check? <laughs> and you know what? Uh, it's like almost some of you thinking, praying, please don't send me to Africa. Because the Lord might say one dollar. <laughs> so you're afraid to ask. So better don't ask. Uh, wait, wait, the Lord say, you know, put less, so better put more. Oh, you greedy fella. Repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. <laughs> I prayed to the Lord, and the Lord said, this is the thing that you're praying about. I say what? A washing machine. I want you to get the price for the washing machine and write that for the check exactly for that. And I remember it was about $800. I know this check uh, in the natural is good enough for 10000 or 100000 But the Lord told me, write it down exactly for the washing machine, by $800. And then tell this person what you root it for, what you use it for, and let the person know. So I did. So you know what? Uh, so after I did that, I, I told the person, thank you for the love and trust. And then when I did that, something was released back to the person. And that is, the person know I can be someone to be trusted with money. See, that is more valuable than gold. The character. And when that, when I did that, something entered into my character and became a part of me. Something, in, something tangible in the character so that from that day onwards, I could not be tempted by money. I passed a big test. It just like, uh, Abraham was given a choice by the king of Sodom. Keep everything. Abraham said, no, I don't want to keep everything. Take back. That, he actually asked him, take back everything. Except what the young men uh, really taken. Uh, that one, uh, now they, they need that they one, uh, give it to them. But otherwise, it's not him taking, the young people who were with him. And he said, the rest you take back. I don't want one single, I don't want even that. Yeah, uh, that, that socks there, don't want. You know, that shoe there, don't want. But smaller, the shoe track, don't want. Oh, that tiny needle, don't want. Everything he don't want. Not one thing. He passed the test. Do you know that immediately after that, God appeared to him? Everything is a test. Life is a test. And I'm telling the story, so let me read from that story. When he came back from the battle, God was watching everything. You think God not watching? I live my life, uh, let me tell you, consciously being watched by angels and Jesus. I'm never, 24 hours, I'm always aware of them. And I live my, my life, even when Physically, I'm alone. I'm not alone. I know I'm being watched because I'm the voice that cry at midnight. 24 hours, my breath and everything they're watching. What I do, what I say. 24 hours. It is almost like the more authority you have, the more you can shake the heaven and the earth, correct? One wrong thing can shake. Let's say right now, God sits on the throne. God says, Oh, okay. He won't do that. Half the universe dropped down. 
So it's important for us to know whether God can trust you. And you know God will test you whether you can be trusted. Even Jesus has to be tested before God. Before God could honour Him. He know that He will pass that, but He has to go through it. So, in... Um, oh, that's way back before chapter 17. Uh, and, um, oh, okay, yeah, this part. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, oh, so don't go this. I, so don't go destroyed. Okay, I, Melchizedek. Okay, let me get the highlight. That's when Melchizedek just appeared to him. Um, let me highlight his name. Because that encounter is the first and last time he encountered Melchizedek in chapter 14. There it is. And uh, Okay, Abraham met Melchizedek in verse 18. He had a beautiful time in covenant with uh, Melchizedek. And then, immediately after a spiritual encounter, the king of Sodom came in verse 21. Give me the person, take the goods for yourself. Abraham said, I have raised my hand to the Lord. That means he has made a covenant. He has spoken a covenant and oath to God. He says, To the Lord God Most High, the possessor of heaven and earth, that I will take nothing from a trap to a sandal strap, that I will not take anything that is yours, lest you say I have made Abraham rich, except only what the young man had eaten, the portion of the young man who went with me, and a escort memory. Let them take their portion, but I want nothing from you. He said that. Immediately after that, look at chapter 15. Remember, the chapters are continuous. After these things. See the word? What things? He met Melchizedek. He was tested. He refused millions of dollars. Those are millions of dollars in our time today. He didn't even want one dollar. Doesn't want it. He said no to it. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abraham in a vision, saying, Do not be afraid, Abraham. I am your shield, your exceeding great reward. So God came and said, Here I am. Say, Oh God. And God said, I am your reward. Isn't that the best thing? What is God worth? God came and said, I am your reward. Whoa, I got God. I gave up that. I gave up millions of dollars. I have God. That's powerful. So we were talking about what's your definition of health. What is your definition of wealth? And what is your definition, most of all, or perfection and perfection does not come overnight it comes each time you are tested the test comes after you have received something not before in Mark chapter 4 only after the word is sown Then the test comes. Only after something good happens, then the test comes. Only after God gave you something, then the test comes. And Abraham passed many tests, you know. That's why God loved him. God loves him. Remember one of, to me, one of the hardest tests uh, was to give up Isaac. He has Isaac for 30 over years. And Isaac was a gift from God. Then God asked him, Give me back that gift. God wants to take back. Not really. He was testing whether now you got this blessing, you forgot me. That's all God wanted to do. The Bible says God tested him. He used the word test. 
because God wants to see whether he's still perfect whether his heart still love him whether his heart was perfect and Abraham was willing and he was able to persuade Isaac he said if Isaac was the one he's grown he can choose why didn't God record clearly that he chose because the father was the one who must make the decision you know sometimes the hardest decision has to be made by the leader by the head of the family by the one who has authority the hard decision must be made and you want to become a better person to be perfect you must make the decision you must make the decision who you choose to friend make a decision what you want to do especially got peer pressure wrong influence or especially get persecuted for it or especially when you might lose some friends when you make the right decision will you still make the right decision or, or uh, 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 and lose a friend or keep the friends make the wrong decision a lot of choices and so we need to have a good definition because that definition defines you it will define who you are like in a buffet if you cannot see it you cannot eat it and sometimes buffets are quite interesting you know sometimes buffet you you pay let's say you go to some of the cheap buffets you know to me here Singapore cheap is about I think there's a $15 one I saw one time and uh, we come with a voucher then another one was 20 something dollars most hotels want about 50 plus and all that and so if you go to any buffet sometimes especially if it's a very big place you 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 you've been you've been eating for one hour, one hour. Then suddenly somebody brought something to your table, and you're with friends. Where did you get that? <laughs> I didn't see that. It's either just came out, or you say, oh, it's the other corner that most people don't go. What? I thought that was a wall. No, no, no. You know, you see here, you see it. behind that got some more things. So sometimes you didn't know there's another section of the buffet, and you miss it all together. And you really thought, wow, good, huh? good, huh? good, huh? good. Huh? You didn't know that was very, very good. <laughs> and I don't know, I, I haven't seen it yet. Remember, I haven't seen it yet. But I'm sure if this buffet was done in China or in a place where people are very sneaky, they will put the most expensive food, huh? harder to reach. Or they put the most expensive food huh? very slowly. Mm. Okay, wait a while. Mm. Oh, yeah, well, you know, the cheap item. They, they wouldn't put like lobsters, <laughs> you know, or, or the expensive stuff. Everybody should finish. Uh, especially, you know, people who, who, who do not have the courtesy of eating a buffet. Uh, now, so that nowadays in Singapore, you will have a say, any food remainder, we will weigh and, and you have to pay a fee <laughs> based on how much weight. I say, why do people want to waste food? You know, they go and the eye is bigger than the stomach. So you eat halfway, cannot finish it. But you're taken, cannot pull back. So what a waste. And so I believe there was one time in China I read that there is a buffet and a group of people from China come. Uh, no, no, you know, I mean, I don't mean to demean them, and I mean, there are a lot of nice uh, people. Uh, in China who, who are well, well trained but generally sometimes some of them they might come from a country or not, not used to but maybe their first buffet or whatever or second or third so they, they, they must have gone to a few so they got this, this habit so they go they aim for the prawn <laughs> and what they eat uh, is more than the buffet price until sometimes the buffet they say okay limited this part how many you can take otherwise the person go bankrupt so they have to, you cannot have a buffet where everything cheap, they have a few good things to attract you. So, God doesn't play that game. God puts up all his buffet, spiritually. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, He who loves God, eye has not, eye, eye has not seen, ear has not heard, nor enter into the heart of man, the things that God has prepared for all those who love Him. Free! Those who love Him. So much. And you say no one has seen before. No one has heard before. 
And it's a wonderful place, I can tell you. Many of you don't realize that, but over the past year or so, you might felt a difference in all the preaching, teaching. My relationship of Jesus from my walking, close, close. Now my relationship with Jesus is like that. Very nice. That's why sometimes you hear coming out from the preaching. I say, I ask Jesus about this, I ask Jesus about that. You know, Jesus always feels like, I get very instant answer. And Jesus calls me my beloved. Uh, he not only loves me in the Bible, he actually tells me, you know, you know, I'm very, pre- ve- this is the word here, I'm very, very precious to him. Especially when you pass so many tests, and he, he knows the cost. He knows, Jesus knows the price I paid to be close to him. Remember I said, I want to be the man who walk closest with God. Only he knows the price I paid. Only he know the price that is paid. And so it is important for us to define what is perfection. So we have these two definitions. One is perfection is linked to God, this is God, Christ and New Jerusalem. And that one we, if you remember the words, let me see why they still have it. Oh, I got to my keys. Let me type perfection. Perfection. And there the scripture come out. This was the first verse we have. And um, the mighty one God, the Lord, has spoken and called the earth. From the rising of the sun to its going down, out of Zion. Now, Zion is a prophetic name. It's a real mountain in Israel, but it's a prophetic name talking about New Jerusalem. Because it's used in the book of Hebrews. We have come to Mount Zion. Then he says we have come to New Jerusalem. So it's like a synonym. And he said, out of Zion, the perfection of beauty. And I talk about how perfection is actually a life force that came from New Jerusalem through the throne room to us today. It's all linked up together. And uh, although I didn't turn to the scriptures, I think I might have. Uh, I mentioned Revelation chapter 3 that when God writes his name on you, you're equal or you're linked to whatever the name is. But I mentioned about if you wear a t shirt, I think I have one, one red uh, jumper pullover, and I still got the one that I bought in Canada. I bought. Canada! Hi, Canadians. I'm gonna. Am I this? Yeah, I'm preaching there from Canada on Sunday. So uh, maybe I bring the red jumper with Canada! And by the way, those of you online, uh, tune on the next week because you have the Canadian worship leaders worship. And so we'll get that broadcast. I'm sure Pastor Elijah and uh, Gmail, they're all there, plus uh, Charity and all. Uh, Jewel is there, and now we love to see the worship that is there. And I love, uh, uh, I would say, Elijah plays the synthesizer like I play the piano. (laughs) 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 Elijah, Pastor Elijah. Yeah, I love how he plays the synthesizer. He makes the synthesizer comes alive. (laughs) Comes alive. I would love to send Steffi there, you know, stay there three months. (laughs) Then she come back. On top of that, Steffi might come back with a new hairstyle. <laughs> new hairstyle is optional, but come back, you know, with the anointing. Okay, so be bold and, and pray for that, you know. So, you know, open for you if you want to go there for a few months, you know, I'll make arrangements with him. <laughs> oh, but what do you do with for musician? Oh, we got Gmail, he's here, oh, exchange, okay. <laughs> okay, temporary exchange, or whatever he wants. Okay. So, anyway, so, it is it's interesting. So, those online, you know, look forward to, to see the Canadian worship and uh, Canadian team worshipping. And that will be wonderful. Praise the Lord. So, we will have, uh, when COG is completed with 10,000 churches all over the world, you've got different worship. It will be interesting. I'm interested to see how all the cultures sing an oasis of love. <laughs> I could imagine the African version. Boom, boom. 
I found an oasis of love. You know, and then we come to uh, China, you know, and then maybe uh, Pastor Abraham, all the rest say, I found an oasis of love. <laughs> <laughs> That's easy. And uh, so all the different cultures, uh, whatever. It is interesting. And so we're going to have that uh, from the Canadians and from Canada the next week. But here, uh, I talk about the, uh, I, the, the red, sh- red pull, pull over that I have, the jumper. Yes, Canada. So if you wear the word Canada, you are connected to it in some way. And if you don't believe it, go to a country that hates Canada. <laughs> and where I love Canada, <laughs> it's something like it's something like you go to Palestine and you wear I love Israel. <laughs> Good target practice, my friend. <laughs> So obviously you should not, you know, you should be discreet. But um, um, but when God writes on you His new name, it says here, in He who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. I explain what the pillar was. He shall go out no more. I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the New Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven for my God. See three things He writes on you. When he writes the name of God, suddenly you're tied to God. It's like cable that's linked. I call it three-phase wiring. Then the second link is, he writes, New Jerusalem. Do you know, once you reach the stage where he writes New Jerusalem on you, you are actually permanently apart. And not only that, your name is also there. There's a part of it, the structure belongs to it. I know the apostles and the patriarchs are the foundation and the, and the gates. But those of you of the 12 plus 12, you're on both pillars. And uh, uh, sec, uh, first generation four, they are the foundation of the corners. And uh, then the second generation four are the uh, four corners of Jerusalem. Your name is there. Do you know what a privilege it is? What a privilege. Satan is the type of person who like you to focus on all the negative, forgot the big picture. All the wonderful things. And then, you want to focus on one day. It's almost like God told Adam and Eve, all the trees in the garden are for you, your fruit, except one. Then they go zooming in, looking at that one. What about the millions and billions of good trees? It is important. Focus on the good things in life. Now, those of you, some of you have lived long enough on the earth. Isn't this true? And those of you young ones coming to learn on the earth, the life, let me tell you this thing. So say someone who is almost like ancient of days <laughs> and is this life is nicer to live if you focus on the positive and good things and you enjoy living a long life on earth as long as you want to live and still can look young but if you want to focus on the negatives in life uh, even one man uh, is a horror living it's like hell and it's up to you whether you want to make this life that you have, which is not an easy life to live. Heaven is easy, New Jerusalem is easy, but this life is not easy. It's up to you whether you to make this life heaven or earth, or hell or earth. The difference is your choice. By choosing to focus every day on what you don't have, every day, it will become hell for you every day. And your next door neighbor might just focus on all the good things. He might have no TV, he might have no internet, and he had to go to the internet to the Starbucks and run back. But he lived a simple life, every day singing, worshipping. Why no internet? So singing, entertain himself. And he lived a happy life, and you live a miserable life. But your next next door neighbor, 
on the same planet Earth with the same moon, same stars, same air that we breathe because your oxygen and you next door is quite close. <laughs> it's you who make your own life miserable. Don't blame anyone. And sometimes within the same family, one child, you know, oh, oh. of course sometimes parents treat differently, cannot help. But generally, <coughs> parents still love you, no matter what. And, you know, one child can be happy, happy, eh? the other child, don't like this family. Hey, who? Same, who? Same children, one like, one don't like. It's your attitude that determines whether you enjoy this life. My advice from an old ancient of ancient wisdom from the Lord, from the ancient days, is this. Just enjoy your life. <coughs> you don't have to go through the book of Ecclesiastes and sing that Ecclesiastes horrible song. Vanity of vanity, always vain. Being a super wise man, also no point. He died like the fool, you know. Being rich, oh no point. He died like the poor man. What a horror! Until he only got one conclusion: just enjoy your life. Hey, he could have told, he could tell everybody at the beginning because he was Solomon, who keep trying to get more, 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 more. Not enough. One wife, not enough. Need 1,000. <laughs> That's madness. Correct? You love one woman, enjoy one woman. You don't need all the 999. Why? Because if you really got 1,000 and you love only one, you got 999 <laughs> coming after you. Each one pull one hair or both up. <laughs> so, one needs to learn how to be satisfied. One person can have one apple tree, but he loves the apple tree and enjoy the apple every day. The other person got apples, oranges, papaya, and still not happy. In the end, you ask yourself, what can make you happy? Which comes back to this point here, that we say, when the name of the written on you, this is your blessing. And Jesus even write his new name on you. Which comes to this point, what is perfection comes out of Zion. And the key here is this. Point A is this. Perfection is just union with God. And how much of God coming out from you. This one is not a struggle. Every day just be that close with Jesus. Be that close. And Jesus will make every day fun for you. I enjoy waking up every morning, I enjoy sleeping every day, I enjoy my life in God. Because there is Jesus. If there is no Jesus to me, it's a horror. <laughs> to me, as long as I have Jesus, I'm happy. I'm happy. Even if you don't have Peking Duck, although we're going to have Peking Duck. <laughs> Even if we don't have all the necessities in life, no problem. As long as you have Jesus, you learn to enjoy your life. And another thing from the old ancient of day sage, enjoy your life. Don't wait. By enjoy, I don't mean go and spend all your money and go on the wrong thing, please. What I mean is, learn to find joy right now. Don't keep postponing your joy. Oh, I will be happy when, I will be happy when, I will be happy when this and that. No, 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 no. Right now, be happy. Amen. Then your life is a better life. Because whatever has to come, has to take time to come anyway, correct? Yeah. So why wait until 10 years to be happy when you can be happy now? Why wait until 1 year to be happy when you can be happy now? Open your eyes and look at what you have. Count your blessings every day. You will be the happiest person. But if you count your curses every day, <laughs> of course you'll be miserable. Count your blessings every day. Then you'll be the happy person. Nobody needs to make you happy. You might wake up, you know. You know people count sheep to sleep. Well, you wake up counting blessings. Then by the time you wake up, 
as you count, one blessing, two blessing, three blessing, four blessing, uh, by the time you wake up, one thousand and one, ha, 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 people say, hey, why are you laughing when you wake up? Uh, I've just counted one thousand and five hundred sixty seven <laughs> blessings. So, count your blessings every day. Make you a happy person. And life is easier to live. Second definition, you all define that love is perfection, having love. And which is true, perfect love casts out fear. But what the Bible didn't tell you, no, John, the first apostle, tell you, perfect love casts out fear. He defined it in the opposite way. I like to define it differently. Perfect love produces joy. And the joy of the Lord is your strength. So if you truly have love, and there are different degrees of love. Why did the Bible say first heaven is peace, second heaven is Smyrna, the church of Smyrna, Ephesians is peace, Smyrna is love, Pergamos is joy. And where are the saints today with the Apostle Paul, third heaven, in joy? Yeah, in joy. The Lord says, enter to the joy of the Lord. And because there are other degrees that are there. And do you know that peace is the beginning of love? Love is, you begin to see, the first thing that hits you when God loves come to you is peace. And all the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faithfulness, meekness, temperance, nine gifts, all is from love. That's why it started with that. It's all derivations of love. First Corinthians 13, the, the poetic place where Paul talk about love. He says, you know, love is this, love is that, love is all these things. Love rejoices not in evil, but rejoices in good. Love is all the, love, love thinker no evil, all those things. You find all the nine fruit inside First Corinthians 13. That is from love. Since the seventh heaven is progressive plus simultaneous at the same time, because all work at the same time, but truly, peace is the beginning of love then you actually begin to feel the love. God shared His love abroad in your heart. And the finale of love is actually joy. Joy is love exploding in you when you walk in love. And incidentally, do you know you will only know the fullness of love with some tribulation? You won't appreciate love until love has been tribulated. In Romans chapter 5, it tells us here, and verse 3, not only that we, but not only that, it says, we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. In verse 2, now Romans 5 verse 3. And not only that, but we also glory in tribulation. That means you go to tribulation. Knowing that tribulation produces perseverance, perseverance produces character. See that character. Character, hope. Hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured in our heart. So only through the love it, you can feel, through tribulation, through sufferings, can you know deep love. Because the opportunity to develop deep love is the same opportunity to develop deep hate. Every situation you face can make you either a more angry, hateful person or more loving person. No middle ground. That is why most old people, most of them, they've seen so much suffering in life, they've seen so much things, they very hard to smile and have joy. Some of them, they go permanent frown upon their face. Because life has been bad to them, sad to them. Too many memories experience. It is important for us to know that joy is what you can gather each day. Even Jesus said, each day's trouble is sufficient for the day. Just learn how to find your pot of joy every day. And every day as you rejoice, that joy will increase and it's joy is actually love exploding. But I want to ask one thing here. Can you give me some synonyms for joy? Because when I talk about joy, many people don't realize how practical it is. 
And I'm going to use a different color for synonyms. Synonym for joy. Synonym means equal words. Exuberant. Wow, big word. Eh? <laughs> Exuberance. Big word. So you exuberate. <laughs> okay. You exuberate. <laughs> Another word. Hey? Merry. Happy. Happy, yes. A merry heart. Do good like medicine. Merry, yes. I know that happiness is like on the earth, but happiness does not necessarily have joy. Correct? Because it's just a world. But joy will have happiness. Can you see? The reverse is different. If you are joyful, you're sure to be happy. And you might have happiness, temporary happiness, but you don't really have joy. So let's include happiness inside. And actually there's a song, old, old song, I think it's from the Bible. Happy, happy is the people of God in the Lord. <coughs> so, happy. People are happy. And there's a Hebrew word for happiness too. And so the Hebrew for rejoice include the Lord saying, Smile, be happy. Say, hey God, are you McDonald's? Because say, how dare you call me Mac? I'm not Scottish. <laughs> right. So... <laughs> but God commanded His people when I bless you and done all this thing make sure you rejoice even Jesus commanded something so what command? when? Luke 6 when men revile you persecute you take your name and throw it out like evil what did He say? rejoice and and leap for joy Jesus asked us to do that but I see many pers people persecuted eh? their legs don't know how to jump instead when they're persecuted eh? instead of leaping eh? their legs grow shorter <laughs> until it's so short eh? if the pulpit is there they hide you know Instead of leaping, they go crouching. Do you know that leaping goes this way, crouching goes, <laughs> which is the psychological posture for sorrow and being burdened. All babies and all humans naturally in every culture crouch when they are burdened and sad. But Jesus said, leap for joy because He wants you to reverse your body. So, happiness, Mary. Some more thing, I'm looking for some words. Some euphoria. Euphoria. Why well, you really like big words, uh, smart Alex? <laughs> euphoria. You know, some people right now on the internet uh, is probably referring to the dictionary. <laughs> euphoria. Is it like, like from Europe? No, no, no. It's just a different word. <laughs> Actually, it's from the Greek. You is good. Euphoria is a kind of blessed, happy bliss blissful feeling but I want to put in one more word so that we can spend time in different things and end exactly at 4.30 ok <laughs> right Peking Duck on the way no no this sermon, second sermon is not sponsored by Peking Duck <laughs> right but uh, you have this word pleasure enjoy yourself Many people don't know to enjoy themselves. So when they enjoy something, they feel guilty. We have lost the ability to enjoy. And, you know, when food is there, you know, wow, feel so guilty eating. Actually, anything you can feel guilty, you know. Anything. You know. If you've got too much money, you also can feel guilty. Everything can make you feel guilty. It is important to have the freedom to enjoy pleasure. Because when joy is bursting, what do you have? Pleasure. Correct? Every nerve in your body feels pleasure. Joy is supposed to be enjoyable. I haven't seen joy that is not enjoyable. 
Have anyone tasted unenjoyable joy? There is no, it doesn't exist. It's an oxymoron. It doesn't exist. Unenjoyable joy. Hey, Jesus said, here, have some joy that is unenjoyable. Jesus, what is that? Jesus wouldn't call that joy. He would call it something else like endurance or something else. You know? Or some, something that, that makes you tough and all that. It, it's something... But joy has to be enjoyable, pleasurable, gives you tingles, gives you goosebumps, gives you a thrill up and down your spine. So the question is, are you enjoying your prayer? No, 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 I just have to do it. Don't do devotion. Uh, all the devil come after me throughout the day. Oppress me. Then I say, uh, no wonder you're not perfect. See, you're talking about perfection, right? I'm actually teaching you uh, a way of perfection unlike any teaching you have. Because most people teach you perfection uh, is, you all know Thomas A. Kempis, right? He wrote a book called Imitation of Christ. I, I like that book. Then you read the book, uh, the book is quite thick, you know, it's a paperback book, they got hardcover. The Imitation of Christ. So you think, wow, how to imitate Christ. <laughs> about one third of the way, you're very miserable because so... So hard, so tough to imitate Christ. And they do. A lot of these books are based on works. You know, pray, 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 pray 10 hours, sure, joy come. Yeah, but, but, but five hours already die. <laughs> so do, la, do, do, do until you enjoy. What kind of teaching is that? Where did it come from? Do you know? At the very beginning of their Christian life, Jesus says, My joy I give to you. He didn't give the joy at the end. <laughs> Although you can see the joy, the great joy in the ending, he, that joy is experienced now. For the joy that was laid before him, something was bubbling. Because before Jesus, let me ask you this question. Before Jesus went to the cross, correct? John 13, 14, 15. Then 17, he prayed. 13, 14, 15. Didn't in those last sermons, 13 is where he got a communion, a covenant with them. Didn't he say, My joy I give to you. Before the cross. Now, if Jesus didn't have joy, how dare he say, My joy I give to you. He also never said, My future joy I give to you. No! Jesus was feeling... And a great amount of inexpressible joy that Peter also tasted. He said, Well, it's joy unspeakable and full of glory, full of glory. Remember First Peter. Joy so great, you got no words to express. And only those who know this joy can become perfect. Because... It is back to the picture. Some of you didn't realize the relationship. Let me show you this picture. Where's this picture? Ah, this one. Remember this picture last week? What causes people to be imperfect? Wrong desires, sin, and when sin has grown, it becomes death. Correct? What causes people to grow into perfection? The law of faith, the law of righteousness, the law of spirit life, which is a counter antidote against this. Not just antidote, it conquer it. I draw a circle, it conquer this spirit area. Correct? And you know where we are on this chart? Some of you think that we are way past here. Where are we on this chart? Kindergarten here. We are having the right desires. Hey, you mean passing a piece so long? Ha? Today we only step one. Ha? Yes, not just step one. Step one A. <laughs> this is going to be a long series. It will last till October. Hopefully, you know, November. Maybe December. Maybe Christmas time. You are so full of joy that you are chubby with joy but still slim and fit in your normal life. So, what happens is here, 
my wonderful friends and wonderful church people, this is the desire, the good one. Desire. Correct? You must what? You must replace wrong desire with right desire. Obviously. How can you say, you know, uh, don't think back thoughts, don't think back thoughts, don't think back thoughts, don't think. Hey, I'm trying not to think back thoughts. Ah! What kind of teaching is that? The right teaching is think good thoughts, think beautiful thoughts, think lovely thoughts. Then you've got no room for bad thoughts. See, the right teaching is to fill your mind with the right thing instead of just trying to empty, 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 empty. But the law of physics and the law of everything says nature abhors a vacuum. In a vacuum, things will go into that. Do you know what caused the world weather? High pressure, low pressure. That's what's causing the world weather. Stormy weather. That's how they detect the weather. They look at high pressure, low pressure area. When it's high pressure, they will say, you know, good weather coming. Low pressure, oh, oh everything is rushing there. Storms are coming. That's how some of you might have bought a digital weather forecaster. You know, you put outside or you the weather, it goes by temperature. So temperature plus pressure, all this barometer measuring pressure, thermometer measuring uh, thermometer measuring uh, temperature and uh, humi- uh, humidifier uh, humid- hu- humidity measurement. And you got three and so they measure all those things. All those things help to determine the weather. The amount of moisture in the air, clouds in the air, uh, the the air pressure that is there, the air and the temperature, sometimes affected by the ocean. That's why you got the uh, uh, El Nino and the La Nina. <laughs> yeah, El Nino, La Nina, both are facts. You know what is La Nina? Opposite of El Nino. So you know El Nino, you know La Nina, right? <laughs> Which is everything affected the whole planet's earth temperature. Bring the monsoon, bring it early or late, affect all of us. Do you know all this movement here? And then this gigantic movement, planetary movement is what causing our weather. And we haven't included a fourth one, solar flare, which is going to be worse and worse. So, all these things, the is caused by, you know what is low pressure? Low pressure is, is like a vacuum forming. And everything has to rush there. So this differential is happening constantly on the earth. Plus the rotation of the earth produces cross winds and all this. We are affected all the time by pressure points. And it's important for us to know that there is no such thing as no thoughts. You have to fill it with good thoughts. But there is a sort of... um, I will talk about that later because that talks about like fourth heaven, fifth heaven. Remember, I talk about the quietness in the mind. So I leave that for another. So just just achieve good thoughts first. And Paul says in the book of Philippians chapter four, tells us this, Philippians four. Uh, if you if you get to know me, although I love the Lord, I pray a lot, and all this, you will know one thing about me. I enjoy my life when I eat. Speaking that whatever, I really enjoy it. And when I fast, I enjoy my fast. It's not like I fast, 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 I see food. No, I still enjoy good food. And some of you think you take me to buffet, I really can eat. But when I fast, I really can fast. So that I fast, fast, I forgot that some other people around me need to eat. Say, so, oh, we need to eat. Oh, forgot you need to eat. I don't need to eat. So, it's important to enjoy what you're doing. And this is something that I don't know. Maybe God put my DNA inside. That whatever I do, I want to do it because I enjoy it. I learned something when I was studying in school. I learned that you cannot remember anything that you don't enjoy when you study. And the hardest thing to remember is the things you have to study and you don't like. So guess what? I could find a way to like it. Then I enjoy. 
You know, when I learned piano, I did not get, I did not have the advantage of learning piano from five, six, seven years old. I learned piano when I was in a seminary. And so I started very late. And the teacher just taught me a few chords. These are the chords she taught me, the piano teacher. The basic, basic chords. So basic, you know. And it was only very short little finger. Now I do four fingers, but, but I, I, I cannot get back to the heavy three fingers I use all. Enjoy it so much, so I go. Then the teacher asked me, uh, Who taught you to do that? <laughs> so I said, It's just very nice. Because <laughs> I just enjoy. So I said, Very good. Mrs. Thomas was her name. She was the wife of one of the professors. And um, uh, I did try to contact them when I was at the peak of my ministry. I wrote them a letter. I said, I'm very grateful. I'm a very grateful person. I don't, I don't forget good people. So I said, no, where are you guys now? And they were back. Uh, they were retired missionaries. They were in the Baptist Seminary in Penang. They were back retired. Uh, Dr. Thomas and Mrs. Thomas. Mrs. Thomas was a music teacher. Uh, I, love, I love her. She's a very, very good teacher. She taught me music. I can play today because of her. And so she took me under her wings. And uh, then she, bring the, she saw that I took initiative. A lot of other students, they come back, they say, kum, kak, kak, kum, kak. I said, you're so boring. Uh. You know? So I had to add something. There's some part of me I said, I had to add something more. And so it's important to find the joy in what you do. If you have to go and dig ditches, find some joy to do it. That if you really have to do those jobs, Find some way to enjoy it. And I remember when, when uh, the first time uh, we have kids, we have children. So, young father don't know how to take care of children. So, then sometimes you got to take turns to take care of the kids. So, the, and the kids reach a certain age and, you know, someone, you got to, you got, a, a good father has to take care so that you give the mother a break. So, sometimes I will put the children to sleep. You know, let the mother, because the mother is taking care, so I would put them to sleep. So, I would think up stories to tell them every day. Always think up new stories. Until my stories got more and more interesting. <laughs> they, they, they want to go to bed early <laughs> to hear more stories. And I tell stories like, you know, once upon a time there was a king, really bad king. His name was Ahab, 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 Ahab. You know, then they laugh. <laughs> you know, so... And there was a backing called Ahab. Yeah. yeah. Then uh, all, all the sudden, tell them stories and they love it. And until uh, uh, I got complaint <laughs> from the wife department saying, hey, your, your story uh, made them laugh so much and uh, now they cannot sleep. <laughs> so, and, so anyway, they enjoy. When you just have to learn to enjoy. If you, ha- if you have to do something, please find a reason to enjoy doing it. Then you can do it. Because we are humans. We must find the joy to do it. Otherwise it's tough. And you want because some people who do it without enjoyment, uh, they, they they die halfway. <laughs> but if you enjoy even something that is not easy to do and you find the joy to do it, every day you can get up to do it. You can get motivated. So you find joy in doing that. So Paul tells us here, he says uh, at the end of um, uh, we are in Philippians, right? Okay, Philippians, in chapter 4, he tells them about their thought life here in verse 8. Finally, he says, brethren, remember this is the man uh, who tells everybody to enjoy themselves. Isn't this Philippians 4? Philippians, the book that says, Rejoice in the Lord! Again I say, rejoice, rejoice, with every chapter, rejoice, rejoice. And this man actually is in chains and suffering in prison. If anybody should be asking people to rejoice, we should be the one telling him, Hey Paul, don't don't be discouraged. Enjoy. He is in prison and he was under a death sentence, like a democratic sword over him. He could be sentenced to death any time. But the Lord tell him that he will live. And remember he said, whether to live or die, I mean the Lord. He says, you know, uh, 
for me to live, it's Christ. To die is also gain. See, he don't care whether live or die. Now, these are the type of people the devil is very scared of. You know why? This is what I call discouraging the devil. You say, hey, pastor, discouraging the devil. Yeah, because you make the devil give up. He throws something bad at you. You say, hallelujah! <laughs> he throws, he say, hey, that's not the reaction. Do you hear the hallelujah? <laughs> and he, he keeps doing all the things, hallelujah, until he says, if I don't do anything, they got less hallelujah. <laughs> so let's not do anything. Because the more we do, the more they worship, and I'm, I'm having only burning sensation from God. <laughs> not a good one. <laughs> and the, the, the pressure coming from God. So the demon said, oh, give up. So the demon walked away, oh, shaking the head. <laughs> discourage the demons, discourage the devil. The more they do, the more you rejoice. Sometimes, uh, it's so tough. Uh, your tears flowing out. <laughs> your back is aching. Your limbs are hurting. But you squeeze out. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. And it's almost like you're croaking like a frog. Hallelujah. But the angels multiply that in the spirit. Because the angels know uh, this hallelujah is greater than the other hallelujah. Because the other hallelujah was so easy. Not much pressure. Hallelujah! Well, this one they know uh, is turned to 1,000 atmospheric pressure. <laughs> you squeeze. Most people already die. Uh, but you're still alive because of your hallelujahs. <laughs> and God, God heard the hallelujah because it's so precious. And, and you just say, oh, hallelujah, almost died. You're like Job, almost died. <laughs> right? The devil already took everything, bankrupt. No children, nothing. And the devil just leave one nagging wife there. You know, <laughs> just to torture him more. And then he already bankrupt, got nothing. On top of that, got balls sick all over. He's almost dying, you know. He almost saying, uh, it's better to die. He keep on saying things like that. And the Lord is hearing all these things. Uh. But when Job says, uh, though he slay me, yet, Will I love him? God's heart go. Oh, this man loves me because he got nothing. He still loved me. And remember, it was a challenge from the devil. What the Bible never record uh, is how the devil uh, had to squeeze his tail between the leg if he has a tail. I don't think he has a tail, and go shamefully away because. Job still loves God. He can hear your faintest heartbeat. I know he can because I've been up there where he can know even when one bird falls to the ground and die. He knows. So he can hear your praises even from inside. That's our God. So here, whatsoever things are true, noble, just, pure, lovely. Good report. If there's any virtue, if there's anything praiseworthy, meditate on this thing. Think on these things. Can you see that point? That is something that has to do with this part. Desire, we're dealing with that. That's why I talk about joy, as a very important to perfection. Because where are the church people who have gone home to be with Lord today? They are in third heaven. If you have the same joy they have, uh, what on earth uh, you are there? You're really so heavenly like that. Which comes to this conclusion! Yeah, okay, <laughs> conclusion. <laughs> right, what are we talking about here? You see here, is your desire, which is part of your soul, correct? And here is a law of the mind. Sin is in a law of the mind, correct? So here, something must happen to your thought life. So let me put in blue color. Oh, I already got the same color. Here involves your thoughts. Because thought versus thoughts, right? Here's the law of the mind. 
Desire versus wrong desire. Thoughts versus thoughts. Correct. And uh, of course here, death becomes the actions. It is actions. Can you see the problem with most people? They try to be perfect here. And they judge perfection here, correct? I ask you definition for perfection. Blamelessness. Sinlessness. Flawlessness. See, all these are external what people see. But to Jesus, perfection is the inside. Because to Jesus, like um, Bin Lan brought the verse, it is not what goes into your mouth that defiles you, what comes out of your mouth. That is what makes you imperfect. So if your insight is perfect, because Jesus said in the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus came to make our insight perfect. So that our outside will automatically be perfect. I like to use the word automatically. You don't even think about it. Because a good tree produces good fruit. But before we look into that, there are these two sections I want to look at. Say, what? Two sections? How are you going to cover? Don't worry. Rejoice. <laughs> right. In this area of the enemy working in people's life, I want to answer the question that I asked in the first service. Which is this one? Da, da, da. Okay. Oh, this is the last one? Okay. Next one. Is this. Hey. Okay. See, talking, let's look from the evil section, evil side. So this is, this is good, this is evil, evil. And so, sometimes you have people who, whose whole nature is evil, a bad tree, correct, a bad tree. They are totally demonized. And then, everyone will be exposed when you are on earth to evil. You will have an encounter. Jesus has it, you have the encounter. And you must grow through. Every seed, do you know that every seed has to go through the tough times? Jesus has to go through the wilderness. Except, don't stay there. Just pass through. And have victory. Don't make the wilderness your home. Then there are those in between which is occasional. Occasional. And this morning, I talked about a group of people. I don't want to give them red color. I want to reserve red color for Jesus. Let's give them a, uh, this color. They are the Pharisees. Where Jesus say, your father is the devil. <laughs> Remember that statement? I got this morning uh, in the Gospel of John. Jesus says, You are of your father the devil. <laughs> they go, they even more devil come out from that. So their nature is all devilish. So they are in line with that. Then everybody is in the first category. Everybody has to go through testing. Then there are those occasional, like Peter when he was growing, Matthew 16. For a moment of time, he yield to the devil. After he says, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And then, uh, God, Jesus blessed him. And said, You are Simon Bajona. Flesh and blood has not revealed this to you. But my Father in heaven has Reveal this to you. And I say that you're Peter on this rock, I will be my church. Matthew 16, correct? Then after that, in verse 21, from that time, Jesus began to show them that he must go to Jerusalem, he must die, raise up the third day. Look at what Peter did in verse 22. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Do you know what rebuke means? Scold him, Wow, Peter starts scolding Jesus. Ah. You know how Peter speaks in the Bible? You can even imagine what kind of character he has. Yeah. Scolding Jesus. Ah. He dared to scold Jesus. Ah. 
Jesus. And then he, he, he really think, you know, well himself. And then Jesus said, Get behind me, Satan! Or in my translation, get under my authority. Well, suddenly, devil, me, me, you uh, are me. Temporarily, he was yielding to the devil. That explains why, remember I say, good people sometimes do bad things. Then they regret it. Bad people do bad things, no regrets. They take pleasure. They are like sadistic people. But good people sometimes do bad things because temporarily they come under the influence of the devil in that area here. You got some, one example of that. And sometimes you got example like David in the Old Testament. He did a very bad thing. Commit adultery and he murdered and Moses kill someone you know he actually Moses go yeah <laughs> and quickly drank buried buried the person oh, quite, quite, quite. he did it you know and he buried the person you know can you imagine what he felt like after he killed someone quickly dig because he said he buried him so how long does it take to dig out six feet from the ground I'm sure he dig deep enough too shallow everybody will discover and he put the person, the dead person, bury it. How do you feel? Good people sometimes do bad things because for a moment of time, their emotions caught them. Correct? Most of it is all emotion. Do you know the people who oppose Paul in the God book of Acts? Every one of them got emotional problem. Every them were angry, irritated, envious. In fact, some of them envious. And Paul said in Thessalonica, Satan hindered us. He called them Satan's hindrance from coming to you, Thessalonians. The Thessalonians, it says in the book of Acts, I believe chapter 17, they were envious of Paul. They didn't see the devil. They felt emotions or envy. Now, if I help you, if this can happen on the bad side, Okay. Every truth is two edged. You can have people with God's nature. That's perfection. And then your people occasionally. You tap on the right thing. Instead of the world, you tap on the right thing. And everyone is given the light of God. God gives light to every man that comes to the earth. No one can say they never had a chance. Not even those who didn't hear Jesus Christ. Because everyone, light is in your conscience. Your conscience tells you what is right and wrong. No excuse. Even those who never got a chance to hear Jesus and what Jesus did, judged by your conscience. So, everyone has exposure to the light. Some people, their nature are changed. You and I. I would say Paul's nature was quite changed. Paul became a totally different man. Never fell back again. Peter, after the last time he denied Jesus three times, he had a few stumbles along the way when he couldn't understand Paul. So Paul advanced beyond Peter because he did stumble. Peter's problem was try to iming face. I what? I liang, one face. So when the Judaizers here, um, 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 what la? Paul Judaizers say, you dog, anjing, go! <laughs> right? The word anjing is Malay for dogs. He called them dogs, you know. Are you poor, huh? Play around with. Chase them like dogs. And that's why they also don't like him. <laughs> But it's okay. It's okay to don't like people who don't like the Lord. Yeah. Love them with your heart. Yeah. But don't, don't like them because God doesn't like them. And so, there are those who occasionally get, do the right thing. Occasionally. And you need to learn, do more and more, as more and more than your, your nature. It develops. 
into your nature. And this one leads to my conclusion. Is it that one no conclusion? No, leading to the conclusion. <laughs> you all know that everyone can choose what they do, correct? Everyone agree? You choose what you do, no one make you do anything. You choose what you do. Of course, sometimes the other choice is die. Ah. Put a gun to your head, you know, don't do, get shot, die, die, die. Ah. You know, it's your choice. You want to deny Jesus, say, what will happen, Pastor Alex, if someone takes a shotgun, point at you, deny Jesus or die? <laughs> you say, ah. What will you answer? No, I'll not. Right? Die, better. But, you might, you might choose that to testify to him. And say, I will never deny Jesus. Shoot me now. And I will love Jesus. And if you don't mind, before you shoot me, shall we sing a song? <laughs> I love you, Lord. Do what you can, you know. And just talk about Jesus and let him shoot you. So, testify. So that your dying breath is, Jesus, I love you. The person's conscience also, something will go wrong. Like when Stephen prayed while he's dying, while Paul was, uh, saw at that time, was holding his, the clothes. Now here's the conclusion. Can you choose what you think? Yes or no, my friends, my lovely, lovely friends. Can you choose what you think? You can. Choose more. <laughs> because many times you don't make choices and you let your thoughts flow like nasi lemak, you know, kway uh, tiao, you know, and all those things just come, everything comes to you. Or people talk come to you. Radio waves come to you. The news come to you. See in the taxi, they're playing a song comes to you. People talking come to you. Oh, you weakling. Choose your thoughts. Then you can become perfect. Last question. Can you choose what you feel or what you desire? Yes or no? There's no middle ground for you, my friends. <laughs> it's a yes-no question. No, maybe. Even maybe means you can choose. <laughs> yes or no? Then why aren't people choosing? And today, I hope you open your mind. You can choose what you feel. If you want to be perfect, if your emotions or anything goes the wrong way, you choose, I'm not having this. And it might take time. At first, you might struggle to choose. But you choose. And then you go. And you choose what you think. We will explore more next week. But before you go, I show you how to choose in a certain area. Okay. How many year? I think Patrick, right? You could. How many year can move your ear? You don't think you can? Uh? How many year can move your ear? You try. Uh? Cannot. You cannot. You cannot move your ear. Really? Pastor uh? cannot move your ear. Can you move your ear? Your ear can move. Uh? Hallelujah. Can I? Uh? Your ear can move. Okay, can you come, come up here? And can you zoom on his ear? No, your ear can move. This part, this part. Uh, whatever, whatever, as long as he move. Uh, hopefully he can move. Uh, but I don't expect like Dumbo elephant. I know, but so can move. Okay, zoom on the ear please. Thank you. And right behind him. Can you move your ear? Can you see that? Can you see that? Now, how you move your ear is not a direct muscle. We don't have an ear muscle like, like the birds, you know. I know all the words we will dumbo, you know, we need big, big, big ears to fly. No, you move your ear because something here, right, the muscle here, right? Okay, now, you move your ear, let me synchronize moving ear. Okay, can you get both ears up there? Right, okay, now let's see whose ear move more. Okay, let's see, maybe I should do this side. Yeah, move, move your ear, I move my ear, okay. Do, do you have to concentrate? For me, I have to relax. Oh. Then I'm moving my ear now. Okay, move yours, I move mine. 
Move more. Make it move more. <laughs> are, are my ears moving? Can you see my ears moving? Yeah, wiggling. Yes. <laughs> more. Powerful move. Make a powerful move. I'm trying. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. That is good. But uh, that is good because you don't move your ear by a direct muscle. It's an indirect muscle. I don't know how, but it's like subconscious you learn to control. Correct? It's an indirect muscle. Now, your feelings are not controlled directly. Come on, you should know by now. You have to do something to get the right feelings. But okay, of these three, which one should you do first? Which one should you attend to? To become perfect? Number one. The first one. Let's why I put it at the top. Because it's very hard to think a good thoughts if you have a bad feeling. You must get rid of the bad feeling first. In physiology, your brain stem sits, where your brain sits, all your fantastic brain with the cerebral cortex and left and right hemisphere and then the back part with the audio video uh, section and the audio video, <laughs> I mean, uh, the controls all those areas, more the, the, the side uh, and you got the occipital lobe and, and then the front has the cerebral cortex. It, your, your, your brain is resting on the emotional center. Your, uh, what is that? Uh, uh, you know, uh, Alade, uh, a day lah, something like that, uh, is sitting on top. It's the emotional center. When all these other brain disappear, you're controlled strongly by emotions. So you do not get good feelings directly. Say, oh, I decided to feel happy. Happy, 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 happy. <laughs> no. You have to do those things that make you happy. Maybe singing makes you happy, sing. Playing piano makes you happy, play. Running makes you happy, run. Walking makes you happy, walk. Reading Bible makes you happy, read. So you must control your ears through an indirect muscle. You control your feelings through an indirect muscle. Get into the area. Maybe read Bible, focus on Jesus. Or, or something you do something and the feelings up because you don't try to think thinking comes next you must get the atmosphere for the thoughts like like do you know you can read the bible without thinking by just reading by baba out loud you're not thinking you're just enjoying the words as you read right it, it make it produce thoughts in you but not thoughts that you're concentrating analyzing when you're meditating you're not analyzing what you Meditate. Sometimes you, as you meditate, sometimes you think about it. But most of the time, you're just reading through. Yeah, and you like, and you enjoy each word and each syllable. And they do strike you as thoughts. The word can make you feel happy. Meditation can make you happy. That's why Paul said meditate. He didn't say try to think this thought. He said meditate on these things. He didn't. He say whatever is good thing, meditate on that. You know, let it flow to you. So, you, once you get those feelings, and you choose what you feel. You choose to be joyful. You choose to think the right thoughts. Then, of course, you will choose the right actions. Remember, before sin conceived, death, desire, in the mind, the law of sin and sin, then the law of sin and death. So, the good desires, good thoughts, good actions automatically flow through. Perfection. I've shown you a key of perfection very easy. And people struggle because they chop, 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 they only see this part. You've got to see the larger picture. And uh, the best part is this. The desires are produced by God's light, God's love. Meditate, sing songs of love to Him, or whatever. Pray in tongues if you need to. And then God will transform you. Let's go to God in prayer. Father, we thank you for your grace and your mercy. We pray that you transform us. Teach us, O Lord, the blessing of salvation. And Father, we know, we know, Lord, one thing. We don't think anyone can sing songs of praise without feeling something. 
And that's one of the easiest ways, Father, to just worship you and praise you. We thank you, Father. In Jesus' name. Let's all arise. Father, perfection comes from you. When your life, your energy, and your joy fill our life, Lord, as we wait upon you and worship you, when your peace, your love grows and it becomes joy, so we ask, O oh Lord, that you teach us the simple truth of perfection. That perfection is Christ in us. The Prince of Peace. The Savior of Love. And the Joy Giver inside us. So let each one know you as the Prince of Peace. Let each one know you as the Savior who gave His life, who loved us unconditionally. Let each one meet the joy giver. The one who says, My joy I give to you. And in that joy we receive perfection. As we choose joy, transform our life and our thoughts. In Jesus' name. Amen. Give Jesus a good clap of praise and God bless you.